it's really an honor for me to have you here. Um, and well, why, why don't we start here? You have a remarkable story. You're one of the few, if not the only, medical doctor to have survived the Khmer Rouge, the, the Cambodian genocide. Tell me your story. My name is Nal Um. I'm from Cambodia. I was a physician and uh, practicing at that time in my own country, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, before the event of uh, the fall of uh, the country to the communists. The communists at that time, they called Khmer Rouge, but themselves Khmer in Cambodian name, and Rouge in French, I mean red. They called themselves the Khmer Cambodian Revolutionary. And uh, at that time, I was a deputy director of the main national hospital in Phnom Penh. And then I remember clearly still on my mind about as yesterday, when I watch uh, my hospital vanish, sing within a few hours before your eye, your own eye. The hospital that I used to work there for more than 10 years, 12 years or 13 years, and I cannot find the word, the human word to describe those emotions that, with which I overwhelm to see all, you know, collapse within two hours. Like, uh, I feel like uh, the, the sky collapsed on my head. And then when I wake up, uh, you lost everyone. And you lost everything. The capital of Phnom Penh at that time habitated about uh, two million and a half. I came in hospital on the invitation of my colleague and director of the hospital at 7.30 in the morning, 7.30. And then I take a round visit for the, all the sick people. And about half an hour or one hour later, the young Khmer Rouge came in. They wear the black suit with AK, you know, what you call AK, AK, right? AK-47, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, a gun from the uh, Russian, I think. And then we were very surprised and very, you know, unusual, astonished to see the, the young soldier came in the hospital, etc. And then the, a nurse presented itself to us. He said that the Khmer Rouge and uh, the main part of the hospital, and they start to ask people to leave. They asked for the nurse to leave first, the staff. They asked the staff to leave first. And then I said, okay, be careful. You watch, you know, you have to, to see everything around, you know, to care about the safety of our patient before leaving. And then half an hour later, another nurse come in, and they say that now, not only the staff, medical staff, but also the patient, the sick patient had to leave. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash freetrialjan. That's ept.ms slash freetrialjan. I said, what? Are you sure? Do you understand well what they are saying? He said, yes. And then we realized that no way. They don't understand at all. They came only like a robot. They obey only the order of their Anka. Anka that means party. The highest party they call Anka. Anka is uh, for five years when people was deported to the countryside, we hear every day, every minute, Anka. Anka, Anka. Anka, this word in Cambodian means organization. Mm -hmm. But they use this word for their party because they didn't, they didn't say political party that 
it's too monstrous to them. So they don't want to reveal themselves who they are and what they are. The Jew organization Anka, in Cambodian Anka. Anka, that means really that would be the, the party, the, the, few, the few people that, uh, you know, the leader of the, the Communist Party. But Anka, that would encompass anything. It's anonymous, it's meaty, it's powerful, Anka. So Anka have uh, unlimited power from the top to the bottom. When you said his name, he come in the name of Anka, you can even one, uh, one milice in the small village can kill you for a yes or for a no. When he said that he's represented the order from Anka, never written, it, it by mouth all the time. Mm. They came someone, you know, from receiving order from some whatever the level of their administration. They came to tell you by mouth and then they give you your sentences. You have to follow them. They punish you in many ways. Anything would be capital one, capital uh, punishment. That means dead. That's all. And they can invent any any language. And here, I want to tell you, Jan, for one thing. We see the communists uh, with their gun, with their uh, anything. But what we usually hardly we can see, you forget that their language, their dialectic language, what we call revol revolutionary language, their own, created by their own, is powerful like a weapon. They can kill you with their language. I remember now, for example, uh, one phrase that they used to call, if you are not, uh, you know, you don't obey them, I mean, obey, or you don't work enough, uh, I mean, physical work, you know, uh, labor, labor work, on the field of rice field. If you are lazy enough, and they say, he used to say that that one can be removed off without consequences, or if he continue and we leave them here, no gain at all. So remove him, no waste, and no waste, and no. If we leave them, if we leave him here, no gain. Then, then I, I, I try to explain this uh, expression. That means one and your, your life as individual. They can kill you right now, and they can save you, but to them, it's no thing, no, at no cost, at no thing to them, no value, no value. Whether you die, whether you live, no value. For them, only the main power that you show to them, that you are able to, to do for them, labor work.